to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Thank you. Would you pray with me before we start? Father, I just uh, pray very briefly that you would speak to us through this text this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that we, in it we find who you are and who we are, uh, and, and how we relate to you and how you relate to us. And most importantly, we discover who Jesus is. Would you help us to see him more clearly this morning? It's in his name I pray. Amen. So last week we uh, looked at the middle part of chapter 5. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat. Uh, which concluded with uh, this command in verse 18, if you remember, about don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And if I want to, if I can suggest to you that Paul was sort of building, he's been building there for a while. That's the key command in the, the doing part of, if he, the first half of the book of Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, is all of the, what have we received in Christ? What has he done for us? Who's, who is the church? What is the church? And he's laying all of these big, incredible theological ideas out for us. And then chapters 4 through 6, so what? What do we do now? And the key doing thing is this be filled with the Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. But He can have control. Don't submit control of your life to something else, like alcohol. <clears throat> and, and if you will, the, the, the key command, or sorry, the, one of the key outworkings of being filled with the Spirit is then found in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission. In the body of Christ, we submit to one another. That's, the, that's our normal way of relating to each other as we're yielded, controlled by the Holy Spirit, if you will. And so now he starts to apply that in the rest of, of, of chapter 5, marriage. And throughout chapter 6, he's going to apply what mutual submission looks like. But actually, more specifically, what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like. So first he addresses husbands and wives. And he says, this is what mutual submission, as you're filled by the Spirit, looks like in the context of marriage. It's an application. And then he's, Paul's going to deal with next week is, is what does Spirit-filled parenting look like? What is being, what is, how, do, how are employers and employees ought to relate to each other as Spirit-filled and spirit filled employers and, and Spirit-filled employees? And then lastly, at the end of chapter 6, what does it look like? What does it look like to be filled with the Spirit in the spiritual battle as well? Because we're engaged in the spiritual battle. What are, who is the enemy? What are, are, what is the, what, what are our, our options strategically? What's our armor? How do we fight? As we are under the control of the Spirit. That's, that's why chapter 5 and verse 18, and then the, 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 the outworkings of, of being filled with the Spirit, that's the key part of this chapter. So we're going to look at the key picture of marriage this morning, and you'll notice if you were listening as Jonathan read, that the key, the key, the second key to understanding this passage, the first is understanding that it's this, we need to be filled with the Spirit. If you're not, as a believer, if you're not filled with the Spirit, and in, in the process of mutually submitting to one another, you, marriage is going to be a mess. But the second key we need to understand Paul's commands to husbands and wives is this picture of Christ and the church. Because he says that marriage is actually a picture of Christ and the church. God has given us 
And he says it later on. It, it's a mystery. Mystery is about Jesus in Ephesians. The mystery that's been revealed is Jesus. In particular, this part, this aspect of the mystery is about Christ and the church. Somehow God designed marriage from the very creation of, from the, very creation of the world before Jesus came as a man, before the church existed, and he designed marriage as a picture of how Christ relates to the church and how the church relates to Christ. So we need to understand those things. If you didn't notice, or maybe if you've been hiding under a rock, this text is probably one of the most highly offensive in our culture today. And I think there are three reasons for that. I think because, actually, there's one, there's, the first thing is kind of subtle. This passage, Paul has a particular understanding, a pre-understanding of what the nature of men and women is. He has a very clear understanding of the nature of marriage. And he also has a clear understanding of the nature of authority. And all three of those things smack in the face of our cultural, cultural understanding of you do you. Be yourself. You're free to define yourself and do your life however you want. You set the standards. That's humanism. Because we came from... We, we developed through evolution, so there's no God. It's atheistic. It, we have, I have a, an acronym for it. HESH. And I've forgotten what it stands for. My mind is, can you tell I'm on overload on details and all this stuff? It, but it, all I say is we need to spend just a minute understanding, looking at how Paul deals with the nature of men and women, the nature of marriage, and the nature of authority. The nature of men and women. It, it's pretty clear in this passage, if we, look, we start with Christ in the church, Jesus is not the church. And the church is not Jesus. They have particular roles. We're going to talk about that in a second. They, they relate to each other similarly, but also differently. And in the same way, a, a man is not a woman. I, I know we probably agree on this, but this is a pre-understanding that Paul brings to this passage. So this smacks in the face of the trans movement. Men and women are distinct. They're, they're equal before God. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2. Paul affirms that in Galatians. Before God, there's no longer men and women. It doesn't mean that God erases our differences as men and women. It means that we come to him on the same footing. Women don't need men to come to God in their place. There's one mediator before God and man, and his name is Jesus Christ. And men don't need women to come to Jesus either. We come to him on equal footing, but Paul seems to hold clearly that there are some differences as well. First of all, men can't bear children. Jessica is Jessica and Jonathan are expecting. Uh, who sometimes men say, "We're pregnant." As far as I can tell, Jonathan doesn't have a child growing in his stomach. Men and women are distinct, and Paul holds that to be true. We're different genetically. We're different physiologically. We're different reproductively. And God made that, and He said it was bad that he made it that way, right? No, he said it was good. It was good. The nature of men and women. And therefore, we need to think about the nature of marriage just briefly as well. You see, in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, God says that he made men and, man and woman in his image. That means that men, on their own, are, only in, are an incomplete picture of the image of God. A man and a woman together in marriage, that's Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, are a, picture, are a more complete picture at a human level of what God is like. That's why marriage is so key. But equally, marriage was given as a solution to the companionship of man. Not just man, but women as well. We need companionship. God said it's not good for man to be alone, and so he brought woman to him. And Adam in chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, has that wonderful psalm of praise, that hymn of praise for his wife, Eve, that God brought to him. And so marriage is, if I can suggest to you, that marriage is God's solution for human companionship, but it's also his solution for the reproduction of the human race. It's his solution then, therefore, for it's the foundation of the family, which makes it the foundation of human society. 
And so, the devil has rallied the forces of this world to attack marriage. Which is a pretty smart move if you're trying to kill off God's good design. Because marriage is kind of at the foundation of all of it. It's key. And so marriage is a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. Not two men. Not two women. Not more than two of any sex or gender. It's one man and one woman. It's a lifelong commitment. And again, it's a good thing. It allows for human flourishing. And yet it smacks in the face of you do you, be whoever you want to be. You satisfy your wants and desires. <coughs> I suspect, actually, that the biblical definition of marriage, hopefully we'll be able to see that in a second, that it actually, it actually is an affront to every culture. If you, if you looked around, there are biblical, godly marriages in every culture, and they work, they look very different. And we'll talk about how they look different in a second. But can I, I read a story this week about a, an Afghan couple, an Afghani couple. Uh, they were believers, and, and this was the wife. Her husband was kidnapped. Um, but he was kidnapped because he didn't beat her at home. They, he, they actually loved each other. They had a godly marriage in a hostile Muslim culture. And when the neighbors and the friends in the community saw that the husband didn't beat the wife, they thought, something's not right here. And so they ended up getting kidnapped. In, in Islam, they hold to traditional marriage. One man, one woman. Everything else is abomination. But it's, it's, it's rotten on the inside. It's okay for men to beat their wives. It's not okay for men to beat their wives. And so in some places, marriage is going rotten on the inside. In our culture, it's being attacked from the outside as well. Does that make sense? So I think if we if we do if, if we if we get Paul's sense of what marriage is right here, it's actually going depending on perhaps we've got different cultures here as well. It might be a little bit of a, a stepping on your toes from how it works on the inside, even if you hold to the outside of one man and one woman lifelong commitment. Actually, Jesus might have something to say to you about how your your marriage functions on the inside this morning. But it's also an affront from those who are trying to attack it from the outside. One man, one woman, lifelong commitment, and it's a picture of Christ and the church, which means, if you look at verses 23 and 24, that there is a particular way that Christ relates to the church. They're, they're, they're on equal footing. If you look down in verse 27, 26 and 27, it says that Jesus sanctified the church by the washing of his blood so that she could be holy as he is holy. So there's an equal footing there, but they relate to one another a little differently. And then we get this word headship, which has some, in some circles is controversial sometimes. But we need to deal with this idea. The idea of headship has this idea of authority, of leadership. And so Jesus leads the church, and the church submits to Jesus. And so just before we get into Paul's commands to wives and husbands, we need to deal with the issue of leadership. What does it mean... For a husband to lead in the home, what does it mean for a wife to submit? And to understand that, we need to look briefly at how Jesus leads his church, is the head of his church. Power and authority in the New Testament are overwhelmingly given, says Jesus, in order to exploit. Is that what it says? Mark chapter 10. The disciples are busy fighting over who is greater. Chapter 10, starting in verse 41, James and John have said, the, sorry, it's the mother of, no, it's James and John directly. Ask Jesus, can you guarantee that we'll sit on your right and in your left when we arrive in glory? And the other disciples hear about it and think, what gives you the right? They were indignant, it says in verse 41. And then in verse 42, Jesus calls them to him. And he says, you know that those 
who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, those who have authority, those who are in positions of power, who have leadership, or responsibility of leadership, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. They use their power and their authority for, their, for themselves in one way or another. Sometimes it's to get hard power. Sometimes it's soft power. Sometimes they, they, they exalt themselves, and there's lots of bribes involved. There's lots of different ways to abuse power, but they abuse it. And then Jesus continues in verse 43, and he says, But it shall not be so amongst you. For whoever would be great among, among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the, and Jesus says this again in John 13 as he gets, he wraps a towel around his waist, he's naked, and he does, he gets down and he starts to do the thing that was reserved for the lowest servant in the house. The thing that was, you wash the donkey dung off of people's feet as they've been walking in the streets all day. And Jesus gets down and starts to do that for his disciples. And so authority and power, says Jesus, is over and over. And then the epistles, Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 5 about elders in the church, over and over in the New Testament, authority and power are given in order to serve those who you are charged to lead. That is the nature of authority. I don't know about you. I, I know around, I find this infiltrating my mind all the time. But I, I, I get to do so. I get to tell people what to do. No, 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 no. I, I mean, it might involve some leading, but actually power and authority is really about serving. It's about laying your life down for those you are leading. That's the nature of leadership. And so if we look just briefly at what Paul tells us and a couple of the places in the New Testament about what Jesus does, if we look at the references to Jesus being the head of the church, there's four things that he does for his church as its leader, as its head. The first thing is that he has, he takes responsibility for it. What that means is that he steps up and says, yeah, their sin, you can blame me. He's responsible for his church. And what that means is that he takes the blame. And he dealt with it. He takes the blame. I think I've given you some references on the notes there for each of those. First Peter two is that is that key one. He 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 he, he takes his sin. He took our sin in his body. He bore it on the cross. He sacrifices. He died on the cross. He not only said, "I'll take the blame," but I'll take the punishment as well. He laid down his life on the cross. You see that in Ephesians chapter five and verse two. Walk in love as Christ loved, loved us and gave himself up for us. So in terms of leadership, there's responsibility. You accept the blame. The buck stops with you, if you will. Stops with Jesus. Sacrifice. Jesus laid down his life. He sacrificed. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 says that God, he talks about all the blessings that we have in Christ. And he says he gave Christ as head over the church. Which means this is the picture of we have access to all of these spiritual blessings through Jesus. So he stewards those blessings to us, if you will. Stewards God's blessings to his church. And then spiritual leadership. There's a wonderful picture in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He talks about the athlete and the farmer and the soldier. And so if I can apply those here, we see those in different parts of Ephesians as well. But spiritual leadership involves seeing growth, seeing someone grow spiritually. It involves seeing someone equipped spiritually. And it's, it sees them, it's, it involves seeing it's spiritual protection, praying over them, and intervening on their behalf. Spiritual leadership. And of course, I ask myself the question, okay, if that's how Jesus leads as the head, it says that the church submits to Jesus. How does the church submit? What does that look like? And I came up with three words. Willingly, voluntarily, gladly. In response to Christ's good, caring, self-sacrificial leadership. Who wouldn't want to submit to that kind of leadership? One that lays down his own life so that you can flourish. Willingly, voluntarily, 
We'll move on in a second to Paul's specific commands to husbands and wives. But again, this smacks in the face of our culture's freedom to self-define and the reality of that, of, our, of, the, of the reigning philosophy of the day of our culture is that it's idolatry. We ourselves become the idols. Live for yourself. You're free to define yourself. Over. The problem with idolatry is that it's not free. It's exhausting. You think of the picture of, uh, in the Old Testament, of those who worship the god Molech. They sacrificed their children to that god. It was literally killing them to worship an idol. Idolatry is exhausting. It's enslaving. It deforms us. It deforms us spiritually. We're actually seeing that it deforms us physically as well. Young girls having mastectomies because they've been told that they're not women. It's deforming. It deforms us on the inside. It deforms us on the outside when it gets carried through to its natural ends. And friends, our job is not necessarily to go out and start speaking against that, but actually we get the opportunity, if I can make a direct application, in our marriages to model what true freedom looks like. And so Paul has two commands for not women and men, but for wives and husbands. And I want to make that distinction because you'll notice it doesn't say wives submit to husbands. It says wives submit to your own husband. That's the call. It doesn't say husbands teach your wives to submit. It doesn't say force your wife. It says wives submit to you. And it says something else to husbands in a second. Wives submit to your own husbands. He actually spends a lot more time talking to husbands, so I want to be sort of, I want to try and respect that the flow of the text, if that makes sense. But what I think Paul means, if I could hazard a definition, when he says, wives, submit to your husbands, I think based on this, we've just talked through about how Christ relates to the church, how the church relates to Christ, what I think Paul is saying here is, Ladies, wives, those of you who are married, God gave you, gave your husband a good ministry towards you in leadership of your family. And so have a heart attitude. That's what submission is. It's have a heart. Consider yourself in this way. Have a heart attitude, a disposition that means that you make every effort to help him, not hinder him, in the ministry that God has given him called into as the head of your family. Let me say that again. My definition of submission would be a heart attitude in which you say, as a wife, you, you make every effort to help your husband, not hinder him in the ministry God has called him to as the head of your family. What Paul's not saying about submission is he's not saying that wives should submit because they're less qualified, because they're less, sorry, they're more inferior, because they are inferior. He's not saying that they should submit because they're less deserving. Actually, I've found in my own marriage that my wife is often more qualified than I am. He's not saying that you should follow your husband into sin. He's not saying that you should suffer sinful abuse at his hands either. He's not saying that you have to agree on everything by default with your husband. I'm not sure that any of us actually do that. Knowing you ladies, wives who are here. It doesn't mean that you don't get to use your brain. It doesn't mean that you don't try to influence your husband. It doesn't mean that you get all your spiritual strength from him as a husband. Can I say, please don't put that on us. We will fail miserably every time. We can't satisfy those spiritual needs that you have. Only Jesus can do that. I think it genuinely means what I said. Well, Paul says, wives submit. He's saying, listen, your, your, your husband, your God has given you a good, he's talking to Christian households. He's saying he's giving you, he's giving your husband a good thing in this leadership. 
Do everything you can to help him in that. In parentheses, because he needs it. And we'll get to men in a second. I wanted to define that as an attitude. I think it is, because Paul says as well, he talks about Jesus' own submission in Philippians chapter 2, and he says, he says, considering others better than yourselves. It's a considering. It's a, it's a, this is how you view yourself. Sometimes we, we try to make this idea of submission about, particularly in wives, husbands and wives, about specific ways that that gets played out in the home. Well, the, and the classic one, of course, is that the wife is supposed to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. Maybe, if that's how the Lord has called you to run your family, but then the problem with putting this on, in, trying to define this in terms of specific roles, specific paradigms of how families work and husbands and wives relate to each other is that actually it's often very culture. It's, we, we, it's, it fits into your culture, but as soon as you take it out of that culture, it doesn't work anymore. And so it's very much a heart attitude. And I, I would argue that actually that can that is actually very flexible. It, it can work in a more traditional household where the husband goes to work and the wife stays home. It can work in a household where both work. It can work in a household where a husband stays home or has a lower paying job than his wife. It, it means it doesn't have anything necessarily just to do with who does what around the house either. Because it fits into a lot of different cultures. And you can live this out in your cultural family community paradigm in a way that glorifies God as well. And, and he probably has some stuff he wants to tweak on it. Which is why I said earlier that Actually, biblical marriage is a little bit of an affront to every culture at different points. And so, wives, if I could say one thing this morning. I would tell you that one of the most powerful ways that I have experienced the grace of God is through my wife. Because as a husband, and husbands, you can nod along with me because it's true. We often are inferior. We often are less deserving to be leaders of our, of our families. We often are less qualified. Actually, in our world today, women are more and more, by percentage-wise, are more qualified than men. So the changes in the next several decades that wives will be more qualified than their husbands, just from a purely academic stance, is getting higher and higher. And so when you look at us and you say, I'm going to follow you. When we mess up and you say, I'm not judging you. I'm not going to hold bitterness against you. When we hurt you with how we lead and you say, I forgive you. And listen, in marriage, it's, marriage is just an application of the mutual application thing, which means it's basically sanctification under a magnifying glass. And so you, you know this. There's nowhere to hide in marriage. So as a husband, when you screw up, <laughs> it's right there and your wife can see it. And there's, you know, when you're dating and you're engaged, it's still, the sin thing is always a surprise after you get married. And so as a, as a wife, when you look at your husband and go, I love you, you still have my loyalty and my allegiance. Right there, you just were an ambassador of grace to us. You ministered Christ's grace and his forgiveness to us as your husband. This gets me when I start to think about the ways I've been a bad leader. I've hurt my wife. And the time she's come back and said, Still love you. I always remember. I'm not going anywhere. All of those things. And I get to experience in the flesh, in a very tangible way, God's grace. Wives, are you, are you, do you have that ministry to your husbands? Do you have that ministry to your husbands? And can I suggest you one step further to, to actually accomplish that ministry of being Jesus 
to your husband. Jesus actually wants to make you more like himself as you're doing. Because to forgive your husband for the thousandth time that he hasn't picked up his socks off of the thing, there's something inside you that dies as well. But Jesus is going, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm making you more like myself. I think one of the applications from this passage for those who are not yet married, there is a gift of singleness. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 17, but he does say it's a gift. It's a special gift. Those who are not yet married, is, is this process that Paul talked, we've been talking about from, from, from the end of chapter 4 and in chapter 5, of putting to death those things inside you. That's what, ma that's what marriage does. It's that same process, but under a magnifying glass. And so if you want to be, get prepared, get ready for marriage, whether you're a husband or a wife, and I'll tell you why it's the same process for both, is, is actually to do the hard, start doing hard work now at killing those selfish, wrong desires in you. Because when you get married, it's go time. And it's going to happen a lot more intensely. So keep learning to submit to one another in the context of church. Keep learning how to lay your life down sacrificially. We could do this in the workplace. We're going to talk about leadership in a second, but sacrificial work leadership in the workplace is unheard of. But you can do it. When you start to use your position, you leverage all of the authority you've been given for those underneath you so that they can succeed. But we make our, our, ser our jobs that are meant to serve those owners, we make them into careers that are all about ourselves. We don't want people around us. We surround ourselves with people who are slightly less good than us because we want job security. And Jesus says, Paul's going to talk about that in a few weeks. We can learn these things now. Husbands. Paul says, love your wives sacrificially. If his instruction to wives was submit willingly, gladly, his, his instruction to husbands is submit, or sorry, love. Love sacrificially, as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her. I said at the beginning that Paul's instructions to wives and to husbands are both an application of the same outworking of being filled with the Spirit, this idea of mutual submission. If you ever asked yourself the question, what does it like to mutually submit to someone that I'm supposed to be leading? The answer is right here. Mutual submission from a position of leadership looks like laying your life down for that person. It looks like sacrificial love. It looks like putting their interest before your own. It's like, how can, but how can you lead? Jesus did. He did it in a big way on the cross. He did it in small ways to show us what it looks like and when he washed the disciples' feet. Everybody knew who the boss was. Jesus didn't pull rank. He had to pull rank a couple of times. But the goal is not to pull rank. The goal is to lay your life down. Because people respond to that. Men, your wives will respond when you start to lay your lives down for them. And so if we take those four things that we looked at earlier and just start to apply those a, a little bit of what Jesus does for the church, husbands in the home, we have leadership in the home has four aspects to it. Responsibility. At the end of the day, the buck stops with you. And what I mean by that is I fully believe, based on this passage, that one day we, those of us who are married men, are going to appear before the throne of God and he's going to say, how did you do with leading your family? He's not going to ask wives that. Wives, you get all kinds of freedom in this. You can get us into trouble. He's not going to do that. In, in the same way that Jesus is in heaven giving an account to God of us. We get to heaven and he says, yeah, they're with me. The buck stops with me. They're with me. He's going to ask us husbands, how'd you do? Give me an account. 
It's not the way that our world portrays leadership. And so, husbands, that means that in, practically in the home, we take the blame and we give the glory away when it goes right. We take the blame. Sometimes, it, Renske and I talk things through. I don't have a specific example, but this happens on a regular basis. And she'll have a much better idea than I do about how we should deal with something. Oftentimes, it's, honey, something's wrong. I think we need to deal with that. We'll talk about an issue in a second. Can we talk about this? Can we pray about this? But I, I've said since then, we'll talk about it. And she'll go, oh, we should do this, especially when it's with the kids. We should do this. If it goes wrong, guess who puts his hand up and gets the blame? I do. Renske gets to be mom and wife and to be free and to exercise all of who God has made her within the context of our marriage, and I get to take the blame. That's what Jesus is called to take. We take responsibility. And if you think you're going to be able to arrive as a man, as a husband, before the throne of God and say, well, that woman you gave me has already been tried. It didn't go so well. <laughs> we take responsibility. Sacrifice. We lay down our lives, our hobbies, our interests, our time, our, our, the things that we love to do. We lay those things down on behalf of our wives. Just like Jesus laid his life down on behalf of the church. It means that we move first as well. Jesus moved first. And husbands, we don't have all the answers. I like to think I have all the answers. And then I actually start having to deal with stuff that I don't. So sometimes leading sacrificially looks like going to your wife and saying, something's wrong, I'm not sure what it is, but we need to pray about it. Sometimes you don't have any more than that. But you initiated, you laid down, you broke the spiritual barrier. Sometimes you feel that resistance to doing spiritual stuff. You lead and we say, we need to sit down and pray about this. We lay down our pride. Oh, husbands, I want you to repeat. Actually, men, repeat with me. Honey, you were right. Come on, let me hear it. Honey, you, you were, were right. right. Yeah. Because usually she is. We lay down our pride. We kill our own pride first. When there's a dispute with your wife, you kill your own pride first, and you apologize first. Don't play manipulative mind games with your wife and force her to come to you first. You go to her. I'm guilty of that. We make the first move. We lay down our pride, our time, our hobbies, our interests, our strength. There's days when you're exhausted, you're tired, you got a full-time job. Guess what? As a dad, as a husband, you have a job and a half. You got a full-time job out in the world, and you come home, and you still got a part-time job. When your wife sits down, you can sit down. That's what we're called to. Responsibility, sacrifice, stewarding spiritual blessings. God has blessed you. God blesses the church through Jesus. God wants to bless your wife through you. How is God, just a simple question, how has God blessed you and how are you passing that on to your wife? And lastly, spiritual leadership. Are they safe? Is she safe? Is she growing? Is she equipped? It's not on you to do all of those things. Sometimes it's just pray. Lord, my wife is suffering. Lord, my wife longs to grow, but she doesn't know how. Lord, she's wrestling with this. Often that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. I'm praying for my wife. I'm praying for my kids. Go to preach a whole sermon before you get here. Is she safe? Is she growing? Is she being equipped? It's not on you, but it is on you to take the initiative to pray about it. To seek the Lord for those things. To care. Responsible, sacrifice, stewarding blessings, spiritual leadership. Last two things and then we'll conclude. Marriage is about sanctification. Yours, sorry, hers and yours. I said this to women a minute ago, but I suspect our culture, one of the things that we've, we've come to believe in our culture is that marriage is a personal decision. Marriage is about you. It's about your happiness. And actually, I think that God, through marriage, 
he uses it to sanctify us in an incredible way. And so in verse uh, 26, Paul says, Jesus sanctified the church by washing her with his blood. He wants to use you to be an agent of sanctification in your wife's life as well. Hopefully because you're being a good husband, not a bad husband. You can do both. And he actually wants to sanctify you through it. I don't know if you've experienced this. I don't know quite how to... I've, I've watched Jesus do incredible things in my wife's life. I think she would say the same about me. And actually, as I've been had a, re, a, a front row seat to what he's doing in her life, he's actually changed me through it as well. And, and sometimes I see things in her life that I'm going, I don't like this. And actually, he changes me first. And then he changes her. He goes, it's a two-way street here. As we serve each other, he sanctifies us. My brothers, we ought, to we ought to seek our wives' sanctification because she is a precious gift. I was just thinking this morning of when, when God gives Eve to Adam, he calls her an Ezer. It's the second half of the word Ebenezer. And it means help. Ebenezer means stone of help in 1 Samuel. And is there, the only other person that is that word is used for, that particular word for helper is used for in the Bible, is of God himself. David uses it over and over in the Psalms. God is my help, my stone, of, my, my strong, my refuge, my stone of help. And so I would almost hazard to say, I would almost dare to say that when you get married, after Jesus and after the Holy Spirit, your wife is the best gift that God could give you. Because he doesn't call anybody else like that. We need to steward and protect and care for and long to see flourish, pursue sanctification together. And lastly, uh, verses 28 and 30. It's a wonderful picture again. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Our wives are an extension of our own bodies, says Paul. He says, no one ever hated his own flesh. Smart people take care of a body part when it's hurting. They listen to our bodies. And our wives and our marriages are an extension of our bodies. They're a member of our own bodies, says Paul. Paul. And so if your wife is hurting, you can't, don't ignore it. Don't make it worse. We need to take care of our own bodies. It's, we rightly identify those who hurt their own bodies as not quite, it's like, it's like, they're obviously sick. Sometimes there's some, we know there's something wrong, but those who don't care for their own bodies, either by intentionally, actively doing something, or by neglect. We identify that as being sick. And so, when a husband doesn't care for his wife, it's the same. And sometimes in the church, we get away from this, and we, we think, well, I'm not actively beating my wife on, on, a, on, a, on a... I'm not emotionally abusing her, so I'm not actively doing anything... But brothers, there is a, a, a disease of passive husbands in the church. We neglect our wives. And this ought not to be. We need to be active, actively serving our wives and by extension our families. Healthy people Let me just close with two thoughts from these final two verses. Paul returns, quotes from Genesis chapter 2. Jesus quoted it in Matthew chapter 19. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Whenever I read these, 
probably because of our, where the culture's at right now. Uh, I always want to go, my wives submit, husbands love sacrifice. Yeah, but where do I get mine? Uh, who take, I've got to look after myself, right? It's a dog eat dog world. But marriage. And part of the mystery of marriage, Paul says in a minute that it applies to Christ and the church, but part of the mystery of marriage that is, is that there is this incredible trust and vulnerability. When you say, actually, I'm going to give my life up for this other person in marriage, and the other person says the same, and I'm going to care for her, and she's going to care for me, and I'm not going to worry about myself. Somebody might go, that's a recipe for disaster. But Jesus goes, no, that's the good way I designed it. That they would be completely dependent on each other. And the reason he did that is because of the mystery. In Ephesians, we looked at the mystery in chapter 2 and 3. The mystery is about Jesus. In this case, it's about Jesus' relationship to his church. And so as we come as believers then, this is how we are to live. We are to live in complete surrender to Jesus in the same way that a husband and a wife live in complete surrender to each other. Why is it that way? How did it get to be that way? Well, that's a little bit of the mystery. Which is why I think that Jesus says what he says in Mark chapter 9. It's kind of ironic that right after he said this, his disciples had that fight about who was the greatest. But in Mark chapter say nine, chapter 8, sorry. Chapter 8 and verse 34, he calls the disciples to himself. And he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, deny all the things that you want, take up your cross, die to yourself and follow Jesus. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. Friends, if you want to save your life, if you want to save your life, give it all away. Give it away to follow Jesus. Give it all away in order to follow Jesus. Anything that is stopping you from following Jesus, get rid of it. If, if you need to do something radical, do something radical. And in the context of marriage, that's something that God uses to help you to get rid of stuff that's stopping you from following him. Because the things that stop us from loving our, our husbands and our wives properly are the same things that are stopping us from following Jesus properly. And so if you want to follow Jesus, wives, to submit willingly, gladly to your husbands. And husbands, love your wives sacrificially. Let me close in prayer and then we'll close in song. Father, I thank you for this message to us this morning. Lord, I thank you for the incredible picture of how you love your church and how you have called us to respond to you and how that is modeled for us in marriage. Lord, I pray for all of the marriages here this morning that you would be at work in them, that you would strengthen them, that you would be at the center, that each spouse would make that, 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 that intentional choice to hold you at the center. For those who are not married this morning, perhaps are thinking about getting married or hope one day to be married, Father, I pray that you would begin doing this work of dying to self in them, in preparation. Lord, one day marriage will pass away. It's a thing for this world. It's not a thing that will endure into the next world. And so the most important thing, Lord, is, is the way in which you sanctify us through it. Because our relationship with you is an eternal covenant. And so I pray that whether single, whether married, whether celibate, whether whatever situation we find ourselves in, Lord, that you would put us in a 
that we've walked into. I pray that you would continue doing that work of sanctifying us and making us look like Jesus for our good and for your glory. It's in your name, I pray.